We are live. Okay, here we go. This is the first of many interviews I'll be doing with some of my collaborators on Xmas and July. Um, let me just see if the feed is working here. It appears to not quite be working yet. It says live on the upper right on my screen. Ah, there we are. Okay. We are live. Okay, here we go. Oh, I'm going to turn that off. This, this is, is the first of many interviews. Okay. I guess there's a delay. There's a little delay. <laughs> uh, so, in any case, here we are. Uh, today is Friday the 19th. Uh, tomorrow we have a big shoot scheduled. Uh, one of our sort of pre-production shoots. We have our production timeline beginning in October, uh, but tomorrow we'll be shooting a little bit, uh, and one of the uh, members of the cast for tomorrow, and as well as a composer on the film, is Greg Fox, and he is with me today. Hello. Uh, Greg is a drummer and musician uh, of many, many different projects. Uh, we've known each other for a little while. And I'm just going to ask him about some of his uh, various upcoming things and things that I've always had questions about. Uh, and then maybe we'll talk a little bit about Xmas in July, which you can support on Kickstarter right now. Uh, Xmas in July is on Kickstarter. It's a feature film. And it is a psychedelic adaptation of Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol set in modern day where Ebenezer Scrooge is a young man and he becomes an asshole in three different ways. So it's a lot of fun. Um, Greg, first things first. Yeah. Um, I would love to ask you about mitral transmission. Okay. Uh, now, that was a project you did last year? Uh, it came out in, in uh, February uh, of this past February. But I... Uh, Started working on it last year, yeah. And could you explain it just a little bit? Um, I got the opportunity to study with M uh, Milford Graves, who's uh, a really heavy um, free, free jazz drummer, played with a lot of people, including Albert Eiler and Cecil Taylor, and led his own ensemble for a while. Also taught a martial arts course, uh, or martial arts school that he he ran a martial arts school uh, in Jamaica Queens where he still lives, um, but anyway I got to work with him um, starting last year, and he took measurements and recordings of my heartbeat, and then we converted those recordings into a MIDI score, and I used that MIDI score to uh, compose a bunch of music, some of which is on the record Mitral Transmission. Mitral transmission. Oh, sorry, I've been mispronouncing. Like, like a mitral valve. Oh, okay. Um, wait, what does that word mean? Um, mitral is, I think, relating to the heart. Mitral valves are the are the valves in the heart. Um, and when you say uh, you converted the heartbeats into a MIDI score, um, can you kind of break that down as if I were an idiot? Like, are you talking about percussive hits? Or no, I'm talking about like a full eight octave scale notes uh, because the isn't just the two beats that you normally think of when you think of a heartbeat. It's actually a lot more electric electricity. It's the sound of electricity being pumped through the organ, uh, and so the valves are opening and closing. And so if you listen closely or have a stethoscope or analyze the waveform of a There's a lot more there, and so by sort of amplifying a lot of the lower frequency sounds and converting them to a score, you can make a you can make a you can make a full score. I have the thing here. I can actually show it to you. I think on the screen. Um, yeah. But I can keep looking for it while you, if you want to keep moving on, or. Sure. Sure. Um, yeah. Well, in any case, mitral transmission uh, is a very very beautiful recording. Where and where can people where can people find that on your website, right? InfiniteLimbs.com. And there are links to it on that on my website. But uh, it was released by a record label called Data Garden, and you can find it on their Bandcamp site. And uh, yeah, I mean, if you search 
for the album on the internet, you'll find various channels for it, I guess. Uh, and there's a physical copy of the there's a there's a physical object which has the digital download on it that you can actually plant in soil. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's like a little card that's planted on uh, it's card it's seed paper. So there's album art on one side and the other side is a download code and then instructions which basically say once you've downloaded this, plant it in soil and water it and flowers will grow. That's I love that. Um, very cool. Uh, so, uh, how did you meet? How did you meet Graves? Anyway, I mean, it's amazing I, you work together. How did you guys meet? Um, it was kind of a series of coincidences and lucky circumstances. But a number of people had recommended to me that I seek him out. Um, uh, other musicians, and then um, I. Uh, have a friend who works with John Zorn, uh, who Milford has done a lot of playing with, so I contacted her and she gave me Milford's email address. I wrote him an email basically saying you know, that I was an admirer of his work and I would like to study with him trying to convince him why maybe he would want to have me over or something. Um, and then I didn't hear from him so I kind of assumed that he was passing or just didn't check his email, but then I about six months later, he called me on the phone and invited me over to his house, um, and we took, it kind of went from there. Cool. Um, uh, do, can you talk a little bit about um, Guardian Alien, uh, what kind of music it is? Uh, Guardian was the band that I, I kind of... I was listening to the, the latest recording, and that's why I kind of reached out to you for this film, for the scoring. Um, could you talk about the genesis of that band and, and basically the, the sort of sound that you're trying to go for there? Uh, well, the band started in 2010. Um, I was getting invited to play solo and wasn't so interested in playing solo, so I was inviting people to play with me. And that sort of, uh, you know, a lot of certain people like... Um, Alex Struchin and Turner Williams were doing it more often, and it kind of quickly became this project, which had its own sort of legs, I guess. Um, but yeah, there was a lot of different people sort of coming in and out, and then it stabilized into being this one group of people, and then there were some changes, and then it was other group of people, so it's kind of gone through a couple different phases of personnel, but uh, for the most part, it's been me and Alex throughout. And uh, as to what kind of music it is, um, I mean, I don't know, I guess from my point of view, trying to sort of do, um, I don't know, that's kind of a hard question to answer, actually. I, I, don't, I don't know if I can really articulate that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would kind of describe it as uh, that's the sort of uh, the big sound, um, uh, drum-led drum uh, kind of electronic uh not so much. I guess, yeah, it is kind of hard to describe. It's, yeah. not, really, it's not really drone music, uh, you know, since the songs have, like, some very serious structure going on. Um, but it is very, it is very, uh, it is a very enormous sound. I mean, uh, I, I highly recommend listening to Guardian Alien recordings on some very big, nice headphones um, so you get all the textures. I mean, I think, yeah, it's sort of just com a combination of a lot of I influences and elements and, and um, different people's sort of uh, interests um, and lots of drumming. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, real and real quick, you want to talk about Liturgy? I think I saw you have a little mini tour upcoming with them. Yeah, sure. Um, Liturgy is a band that I've been in on and off since 2008, and uh, we just finished working on a new record, and we're doing this little tour, which starts a week from today, uh, it's just six days, and um, yeah, I, I'm, um, I'm pretty stoked, it's, uh, I like the new material and everything. Uh, has been feeling real good, so the, the shows have been good, and we're all happy to be playing together. Cool. 
Um, and then uh, sort of uh, I'm also interested in Z's and the sort of the, the progression of that band. I know that you're a member of that band now. That band has been around for a long time. Yeah, Z's has been around for about 11 years now. Uh, when I joined the band, maybe 12 years actually, because it's been a few years since I've been in it, and when I joined, they were releasing a 10-year box set of previous material. So oh, wow. that kind of dates it. Um, yeah. But yeah, I joined, I guess, two years ago, and we've done a bunch of touring. We released an EP, and we have a full length coming out at the beginning of the year. Uh, that was is music we'd been working on basically since we started playing in this formation. But yeah, Z's is a band that I was like a fan of when I was in college. I I never I got to, eventually got to know um, Sam, who has been sort of the mainstay, one of the mainstays of the band for its whole existence, uh, the saxophone player. Uh, and um, I'd been friends with one of the previous guitar players, uh, Ben Greenberg. He's a great guitar player because um, we went to neighboring high schools and I've known him forever. So, um, yeah, I definitely didn't expect to end up playing in that band, but it was a pleasant surprise and the timing of it was good and it's been fun. I'm, I'm pretty stoked on the music we've been making together and we're doing a short tour in Europe in early October. So. Oh, nice. Nice. And you just got back from Japan. You did a tour with Guardian? Yeah. Um... Guardian was on tour in Japan for about two weeks, and it was just me and Alex, and we also each played some solo shows while we were out there. Oh, cool. Very cool. And what is the what was the response like over there? Very positive. Um, I knew that there were people who already were aware of Guardian and my other work, uh, and so it wasn't too difficult to put together a tour. I mean, it was pretty low-key, but... But um, we had a lot of support from a lot of local musicians and artists, and that was really helpful. And, um, yeah, I mean, it was a total dream. Japan is great. It's really yeah. cool to tour there and play there. Very cool. So you tour kind of like a lot. Um, and I kind of want to want to ask you sort of on a personal level, like, like how do you kind of maintain uh, through the kind of rigorous schedule that you – uh, that you that you go through year after year. Um, good question. Um, I'm kind of figuring that out. I mean, last in 2013, I was on the road for just about eight months uh, out of the year, and then this year it'll have been ten months. Um, so I don't know. I'm kind of figuring that out. Um, it's got its challenges, definitely domestic and also just as far as, um, so, you know, having to switch gears between being on the road and then being at home and um, trying to maintain uh, different practices and different disciplines, be they, like, exercise or, um, you know, keeping the house, keeping the room clean, you know, things like that, so... <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 but I mean, I love it, and it's what I wanted, um, so now it's sort of coming to, a lot of work that I've done is coming to fruition to the extent that I'm on tour all the time, and it's how I make my money, so, you know, I scrape by, and I'm on the road a lot, and I get to travel a lot, and I don't know, I'm super thankful for that, and it's, um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's cool, it's like a weird thing. It's like you have like a big idea of something you want to do and then you find yourself doing it and then it's about trying to sort of refine the way you're doing it mm -hmm. and also I guess set sights on other goals or greater goals that you may not have even been aware of when you were initially dreaming about like being in a band and touring. So it's a lot, it's like there's a, the reality of a lot of those things sometimes is like better than you could have imagined and sometimes way shittier, but um, but uh, it's a good balance, and I'm really happy that it's um, the way I'm finding my way uh, in the world. So, yeah. I mean, it kind of leads me into uh, a couple of things. It, it makes me think of a couple of things. I mean, this is uh, this film is my first time running a production. Uh, mm -hmm. I've written uh, five feature films over the past eight years, but 
I've never run a production before, and just a pre-production into production uh, schedule, it kind of reminds me of when I was on tour with a band in 2008 as just being kind of this nonstop, uh, show where you're just on and working and running around and trying to figure this stuff out and a lot of things fall by the wayside like health and nutrition and stuff like this and you kind of sprint forward and you are in fact kind of like living the dream but when you kind of first get to that state there is that kind of uh, balance that you have to find and you have to be able to um, adapt yourself to, to this new kind of lifestyle and not and not just uh, burn yourself out in like two seconds. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I definitely have experienced that burnout a couple times in different ways. Yeah. Um, you know, on an interpersonal level, on a physical, energetic level. Um, so, yeah, it's important to start. That's the thing, I guess, after a while of realizing, okay, this isn't just like something I'm going to have done once, this is something I'm going to do ongoing, you start refining the way that you approach it um, so that you can be, it can sustain itself and so that you can sustain yourself in it. Um, yeah, so I don't know, it's a challenge. It's a challenge that I'm happy to be trying to meet. Um, yeah. Yeah, and uh, that sort of leads me into the, the series of scenes that you're going to be in. Uh, as well as scoring for the film. Um, in the first sort of alternate reality of the film, Ebenezer Scrooge finds himself uh, in a fairly successful rock band, uh, the, uh, the leader of a fairly successful rock band, um, but living too hard, uh, sort of kind of not finding that balance, but rather just uh, pushing to the very, very extreme and uh, and in fact, that's what uh, his this fame that he's acquired uh, is kind of related to, rather than his skill uh, as a musician. So it has and and um, that has a kind of a, a weird genesis for me, uh, since I was on tour with a band in 2008, um, and uh, I kind of experienced the music scene a bit, but not a lot. I mean, I, I would definitely call myself an outsider, but uh, I certainly saw the temptations uh, to kind of neglect health and nutrition and stuff like that, and uh, just kind of push forward. And so your, and, and, and having seen your career kind of develop uh, from my perspective, you know, as a writer, um, I kind of wanted to have you involved and have the band members behind Ebenezer kind of have, having found that balance and that Ebenezer, since he's uh, sort of being thrown around through alternate dimensions, he doesn't have the balance in any of these sort of dream futures. And I think during rehearsal we kind of found a good spot where, where we kind of realized that um, your character might even have some idea about what's going on with Ebenezer, not directly on the nose, but he kind of understands that that Ebenezer's character is uh, is going through something and is kind of unable to look after himself. Right. And, uh, we kind of gave you the character of like this. You're like the Sarge. If the band were like a platoon or whatever, mm -hmm. like you kind of have this like stable energy, and uh, it's kind of interesting. You know, I mean, we kind of got there through the rehearsal, um, but I think that that reflects kind of the 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 amount of work that you've done in the music scene and kind of that uh, your ability to find that kind of stability and that kind of balance uh, inside of it. Yeah. Uh, it's, fu it's funny because, like, I think sometimes I feel like I have that personally and sometimes I really feel like I don't. Uh, so I can, relate, I can relate to the character I'm playing, which is me, and also to the character that you're playing uh, at the same time. Right. <laughs> so yeah, I want to try to because the thing is, is uh, you know, through the creation of this movie, like y there is a le there is a level that I'm sort of critiquing the music scene or critiquing uh, the country living or critiquing the commercial uh, uh, commercial living, um, but I but I think I would much. I would much rather not just make a film about the cliches of the music scene and not make a film that's kind of trying to tear down anything about it, 
but rather one that kind of shows that spectrum uh, of experience inside of it. So you get some, you get people who, you know, have fi have found that balance and, and are able to perform well and enjoy their lives uh, all the way through. And then there's people with this up and down trajectory and trying to to kind of create a realistic portrait of that scene uh, with all the sort of necessary members of it um, inside of the psychedelic landscape of the of the of the larger film. Um, but in any case, like I think what we've been doing in rehearsal is we tr we sort of see the script as it is and sort of see the way that it could be done and then step away from that and say okay what's re what's the what's the reality here what what would these what would these musicians actually uh, how would they actually react to, to a situation like this well I've I mean like I've in my experience it's rare that younger folks doing all this sort of whirlwind touring and stuff like that have a greater sense of balance they do to some degree but I've always admired some of the folks, you know, I've always been more in admiration, I guess, of the, like, older musicians th who I look up to and have looked up to who've continued to do it, who seem to find, like, a greater balance and a greater ability to manage doing their music and then whatever else they're doing outside of that. And, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's sort of something that comes with, like, age and experience, uh, mm -hmm. this, like, perspective about how to, um, you know, think in like a longer view maybe uh, and right. le less uh, less be concerned with like immediate ups and downs of things. Um, yeah. Right, and that's kind of the ultimate uh, frustration of the characters of the film. Um, in, in general, they're kind of living their normal li lives and then there are these fantasies or dreams or whatever um, where they just skip ahead to that part where everything is working out but uh, in actuality that's that's uh, that's problematic because that that does that's not how you get to that place you get to that place through experience and through project to project to project and finding uh, that kind of sustainability uh, as you said uh, inside of the, your practice uh, in order to um, sur survive in the in the art scene, I mean, you know, I, I don't know what your perspective is on this, but uh, you know, writing films and 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 and, uh, and making films, there's uh, there's very little um, there's very little support inside of that, you know, at, at the beginning, and the support comes incrementally. Um, and you know, often I find myself wishing that I could just skip steps, hmm. uh, you know. But that, of course, uh, is you know all part of the fantasy. So I guess that's kind of what we're trying to reflect here: is that you just can't skip the steps. Yeah, I mean, you have to build the foundation before you build the house on the foundation, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's kind of like with anything else. Um, you know, it's like we're, if you're going to record a record, if you're going to make a record. And like the instruments aren't recorded well, it's going to be a much shakier situation. You know, the record's not going to be as good as if you just start by getting good recordings. You know, it's like you can try to just get whatever slapdash, you know, recordings of the guitar and the drums and whatever, and then try to fix it later. But it's never going to be as good as getting just good recordings of good performances to begin with and then using that to make a record with. I think you can kind of extend that as a metaphor to any kind of like creative process, especially when that takes time, is you kind of have to go through all the steps in order to get to the final result, even though a lot of those steps can be seemingly steps backwards at the time, you know? Yeah. Um, the sort of nitty-gritty nitty and everything. Um, yeah, I mean, like, it's very similar with film. Uh, it's like, um, you know, because we're getting shots on Saturday, for example, and these are shots that, that will be in the final film. 
uh, and that's and the post production process is you know at least six months long, um, and so we're getting things tomorrow that are going to have to live on their own two feet for six months, and then for in perpetuity once the film is uh, once the film is actually made, and so you know when we're dressing the set, you know when I'm painting this gold wall behind me. Uh, you know, like these are the things that uh, that are going to be reflected over the course of the next. You know, I'm going to have to stand on these things and say, you know, this is this is legitimately, you know, what we wanted, and we move forward from here. Um, and it is those the, those details that that uh, sort of I think separate the the wheat from the chaff, and you have to kind of know exactly what you need. Yeah. To move forward. Yeah, and also at the same time, like not overthink it too much and let things happen in the way that they kind of are naturally happening once you've set the, the thing up to do what it's meant to do, you know. It's kind of a balance, I guess, to strike between making sure you're getting exactly what you want and also allowing the thing to determine itself, you know. Right. You, you don't want to just... You don't want to just let go completely necessarily, but then again at the same time you have to let go to a certain degree in order to allow the thing to flourish. So that's like a w interesting uh, to return to the theme of balance to strike uh, in a project, you know, especially like this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because you know, there's nothing worse than a than a film uh, a film set that is too tight. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I think you could probably relate to that in in music when, you know, somebody wants to stick too 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 strongly to a to a set idea, you know, that that was the, that came before. And what you need is the basic fr framework and set and set and set the set up in such a way that you have a little bit of time, a little bit of leeway, to play around with the takes, um, just to make sure that you get everything. Um, so I think we'll probably do that tomorrow. It's kind of like. Uh, it's kind of like a wedding, actually. <laughs> because, like, um, you know how, like, sometimes people, I, you know, I guess l lately as I've been, you know, approaching my 30s, uh, a lot of people I know are getting married, and I've been to a bunch of weddings, and it's funny because a lot of people do these, try to do these weddings where everything is planned, like, within five-minute intervals of, like, every event that's supposed to happen at the wedding, you know what I mean? Right. I mean, like, it seems to me like that's kind of a weird way to approach having this day, which, I mean, I understand the, I under, I guess I, I guess I understand where that comes from, but at the same time, sometimes I wonder, like, well, where's the, like, is there, is it even possible to stick to a schedule like that in the first place? And then also, if you insist or try to insist on something like that, where is the there's and you sort of don't leave any room for spontaneous mech to happen. Uh, it's like there's no breathing room, you know. It's like uh, yeah, it's like that striking that balance. It's like growing a tree, you know. You sometimes you need to like give a tree like a guidepost or something so it doesn't, you know smash through your windows, but at the same time, you can't stifle it too much because otherwise it just won't be what it's supposed to be, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and on that note, uh, let's just uh, go ahead and wrap it up here. Um, I, I do want to tell the viewers out there to uh, go to Data Garden and get, a, get, get a, that physical copy of Mitral Transmission and plant those seeds um, okay. because I think that's a beautiful... Uh, analogy and it's a beautiful recording um, so I want to thank you Greg for joining me here uh, in cyberspace to talk about whatever yeah, um, thank you. yeah and you can check out uh, Greg's music and his tour schedule at his website infinitelimbs.com uh, okay. and uh, there's a lot of good stuff coming up so check it out and last note go to the Kickstarter uh, Xmas in July is a feature film. We're on Kickstarter right now. Uh, Greg is composing music for the film as well as acting in it. Uh, we're shooting a scene here in my apartment uh, tomorrow afternoon. So you'll see some footage from that uh, coming up here shortly on the campaign page. And other than that, 
we're going to sign off. And I hope you guys have a great weekend. All right. See you, Greg. Bye, Joel. <laughs>